God asked me a question and brought this to my mind. And he said, what areas in your life that are broken that God wants to use for his glory? What areas are you not using and moving that God has already said, I have made it to where you can use those things for me? What has the enemy put in your life in order to steal God's glory? Bondage? Death? Despair? There was a story in the Bible that brought to my attention whenever I was doing this. And it was of Samuel's mother. She was unable to have children. She desired that so much. And the enemy was using someone else in her life to bring discouragement and pain through it. But God is gracious. And he is good and so kind. He saw her heart crying out and said, I'm going to have favor and grace on you. And she became pregnant with Samuel. Samuel was the one who anointed King David. Samuel went around performing miracles as the man of God. He worked and did incredible things for the kingdom. An area of her life that she thought she would never see life in, God used to bring freedom. Another one, the Shumite woman with Elijah. She didn't even want to receive what God was trying to give to her. She, whenever God said, I'm going to give you a child, turned around and said, don't, don't bring up my hopes. Instead of what should have been happiness and joy at a word from God, instead caused her pain. But the good part is, God's not bound by our pain. God's not bound by our expectation or our reality. Because she became pregnant and she had a son, just as the man of God instructed. What areas in your life have you stopped believing God's going to move in? Where have you had pain in your life for so long that thinking that God could bring deliverance from that is impossible to you? God's not limited by it. There was this another Bible story that I went to my mind. One of the kings of Israel, whenever they were being attacked by the king Aram, he went to Elisha seeking his help. The armies of the Lord, the kingdom of Israel, had very few people in battle. Their kingdom had become so diminished and oppressed by them that he came to God because he knew that the man of God was exactly what they needed. That he could give them deliverance. 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 17. This is Elisha speaking to the king. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory. The arrow, arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the, Ar uh, the Arameans at Ap Apke. God had already declared victory. They were still being oppressed. They still had that enemy in their life. But God said, I've given you victory. He declared it right there. His response, though, is key here. Continuing in chapter, uh, verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. And he struck the ground three times and stopped. The man of God was angry and said to him, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. His response determined how great the victory was. He could have received so much more if he would have acted according to passionately to what God had spoken. God had already given him the victory, but he didn't have the zeal. 
He didn't have that passion in it. Why is that? It works the same way in our life. God has given you victory over certain areas, a bondage in your life. The areas that you think there's no hope, he's given you victory in. The question is, is have you received it? Have you embraced it fully, or are you just simply embracing it with a half heart? The lame man accepted the word that was spoken to him by God's anointed. And he responded in an incredible way. He responded in walking and jumping and praising God. It wasn't passive. It was a passionate display of what God had done for him in his life. He was excited. Where have we received victory in an area, but we have not been jumping in joy about? Where have we been passive, where God has given us victory? Which leads me to my second part to this. The act of vision of our faith. Have we become comfortable with God in our life? With his presence that we no longer are moved whenever he moves? In the Bible, this happened. Mark chapter 6, verse 4. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. Christ went to where he grew up and he started performing miracles. He tried to minister to them but it says he was unable to because they wouldn't receive it. Have we become so familiar with him in our daily life that we lose the awe and the inspiration that he has given? They dishonored him by not receiving him. Have we dishonored him by not receiving him through familiarity? Another example of this, whenever the Israelites were in the desert and God told them, I am already going to give you the land of promise. It's already going to be yours. And they send in spies to go and scout the area. Every single one of them came back with a bad report except for two. They said, it is a land with blessings flowing with milk and honey. It is a great place. But there's giants there. They're strong. We can't overtake them. God had already told them before they even went in that you're going to receive this place. Their response showed that they weren't ready. They could have had so much. They would have stepped in and believed God for what he said. In our lives today, let's step in to what God already has declared that we are victorious in. Let's raise our faith and let's show that through worship and praise. Jump up and thank him. Say, Lord, thank you so much. For the victory you've given in my life. That I am no longer a bound captive to sin. But instead you've given me freedom. That I can walk in your spirit. That I can know that you are moving in my life. That you have given me good things I don't deserve. Can we stand up and be passionate about that? Our passion is going to what lead us to what God has already said. And I want you to get this today. If you can go one day without desiring to say, thank you, Lord, so much for what you've given me. You have dishonored the work that Christ has already done in your life. If Christ has done something for you, stand up, act on it, be passionate. Whenever we have a stronghold in our life and Christ comes in and he removes that be the enemy in our hearts from that. And instead, 
that stronghold is now a place where the spirit goes in and makes residence. An area of defeat in your life that was taken hold by the enemy now is a stronghold for God that he uses to slap the enemy in the face. In our lives, we have different areas that the enemy has tried to steal God's glory in. Don't allow him to. We need to allow God's grace and God's glory to show in those areas that we thought were long dead, broken, and destroyed. Isaiah 42, 13 stood out to me and hit me so hard. It says, the Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal and he cries out. He shouts aloud and he shows himself mighty against his foes. That is the God we serve. He is a warrior fighting on our behalf against what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. Could the greatest area of battle in your life be the place that God is going to receive the greatest glory? Do we believe that there's nothing we can do because that area is already dead and destroyed? Or are we going to look at that and say, no, there may be bones. It may be dry and been sitting there for a long time. But the Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord is telling you today that he is going to breathe life and power into those bones, that they're going to come alive, that no longer is death going to maintain its power over you. That is never what God intended. And in fact, God speaks directly against those areas of death in our life. God did this through Gideon. He said, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. While he was hiding... Moses had a problem with stuttering, but yet God used him to lead the people of Israel. And Jacob, this one hit me. Jacob deceived his brother into stealing the birthright, but he couldn't fool God. He couldn't hide from God. And the only way he was going to receive God's blessing on him is for him to wrestle with him. God wants to use the dead and the broken and the hurt things in your life to bring him the greatest glory. Which brings me to my third point. God receives glory through those things. The other side of the miracle is the glory of God. It is where the world will look in amazement and wonder. As great as the miracle is that God works in our life, as much as the power that is present there, it is not intended for us to hide. It's not intended for us to keep into underneath a lamp. But instead, that can be used to build the faith of you and me. It can build our faith as brothers and sisters in Christ. God is not a God of secrets or deceit. But he is a God of more. And he is a God of greater. And he wants to do greater in your life. Hiding the miracle is holding back the glory of God for yourself. Any reason that you have in your life that says, I'm not going to share what God's doing in my life is self-centered. It is not of God. So today, do you have that issue? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all, with unveiled faces, unveiled faces, remember that. Contemplate the Lord's glory. Are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Are we keeping the glory of God in our lives veiled? Moses did that in the Old Testament after he had an encounter with God. And he did it to hide that he was losing that glory from his face. We don't have to worry about that today. 
We have the Holy Spirit working and ministering in our hearts and our lives every day. That every day we can wake up and have the glory of the Lord upon us. Unveil your faces. Allow the world to see where God is moving gloriously in your life. When God gets the glory, it will lead to the freedom of those around you. John chapter 4, verse 39 through 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, the woman at the well. He told me everything I ever did. She wasn't perfect. So the Samaritans came to him, and they urged him to stay with them two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the women, we no longer believe just because of what you've said, but now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Did you guys catch that in there? Her testimony led those to become believers. They believed that Christ was the Messiah because of her testimony. She wasn't perfect, and she didn't need to be. But Christ had given her life, and she couldn't do anything but just give it back to express it to the world. Have we been expressing to the world the one Savior that gives us life? Who in your life needs to hear about the miracle God's performed in you? And probably a harder question to answer is why are you holding it back? I find it's very interesting that anything that keeps me from a deeper relationship with God and keeps me from showing the world who God is, how great he is, how good he is. Those pieces of my life I need to take and put on the altar for God to sacrifice. So as I'm coming to a close, if there's any area of death or brokenness or loss in your life, you can turn to the giver of life. He will give you so much more. He'll give you strength. He'll give you peace. He'll strengthen your feet. Let him breathe life and hope into situations that you thought were long dead. And don't be afraid to receive a gift from him. Whenever we receive it, believe it, take hold of it, and stand up and say, Lord, thank you so much that you have given me freedom in this area, that no longer am I going to stay silent. I'm not going to be passive with my praise, but instead I'm going to use it actively to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done and how you are moving today in my life. Don't hide it. Don't keep it hidden. Express it loudly and clear. Show the world how good God is. So that whenever you do, and the word comes from your mouth, the people that are listening will be freed. The people will receive healing and restoration. That no longer will their hearts be bound up, but instead they can see life in you. They can see so much more that God wants to give them. It is an incredible way that we get to minister to people in this world. So don't be afraid to run and jump. Come into the presence of the Lord through the beautiful gate, which is the fullness of life. 